you, Rita, and thank you to everyone here. Agreed to the recording art. Thank you to Rita and thank you for all the organizers. I've really loved the Landscapes Live seminar series. So this is a really fun, exciting um, opportunity to be able to talk to all of you about the work that I'm doing. Um, and of course, here we are in Minnesota, um, in the center of North America, where the weather gets wild this time of year and we're mid-semester. And so um, and so this was really a, a nice way to break up um, kind of the, the coming and going of the seasons and the changing of the attitudes of the students, I think, towards their classes with being able to talk to all of you. Um, um, Andrew, Andrew, sorry to interrupt you. At the moment, mm -hmm. you're sharing your email screen. I just, I wonder yeah. if, um, that is presentation. Sorry, that is rather strange, isn't that? <laughs> let me um, let me just. Well, you you can see how many unread emails I have. Um, let's see what we have. I'm just going to do the whole desktop capture, um, here, because it looked like I was supposed to be sharing the screen. Now, that's are we good? Great. No, that's All working right. now. Yep. Good. I'm going to pop Lizzie up into the upper right corner. Wonderful. Well, anyway, if anyone wants to answer my emails for me, um, they're very welcome to do so. So here we are, um with these, um, gosh, with all the things I said before about how to start. So I just wanted to step, move on to a couple of, you know, what I'll just call like pressing questions at the beginning. Um, the first one is actually, where where am I? Um, and the second one is, what's with the super boring title? Like I try, usually try to make interesting titles, but, um, but I think this one feels boring, but it feels important. Um, and this is also a time to make sure that I remember to think, all the groups that funded me. Um, it appears that for this work, actually, I mostly have Germany to thank more than the USA, although the US has been very helpful too. So where in the world? So the the I got a large number of, of text messages and other things saying, hey, wait, you're back in Colorado. Like, why haven't you hung out with us? And just so everyone from who's not from the US and doesn't realize these like um, these wild fun US traditions knows this. Um, so the, all of our universities have mascots. They're usually some sort of charismatic animal. The University of Colorado has Ralphie, their, um, this bison, this American bison, they call it Ralphie the, the buffalo. And yes, they have a team of trained handlers who run Ralphie around the football stadium. So I got to see that while I was a PhD student. And in fact, I'm at the University of Minnesota, which has this much more benign gopher mascot. Um, along with a little um, catchphrase at the bottom that says around campus that means one thing or another. But actually, and this ends up going back to fluvial systems, it was originally heard by a number of Dakota, so indigenous people from here, boys who were racing boats across a riverine lake in the Mississippi, shouting it. And if you talk to anyone, any of the Dakota colleagues I have, they say, oh yeah, that's just sort of onomatopoetic. It's like saying wahoo, which is what the winners were, were screaming. It means absolutely nothing, but it turned into the logo of the university. So, um, so let's get back to the title. Um, I'm at the University of Minnesota, and this is back where I grew up. And it's a very nice opportunity for me, I think, to be able to integrate some of these post-glacial landscapes and some of these agriculturally or mining affected landscapes in this uh, north central part of the USA into our understanding of geomorphology. And so when I say intermediate timescales, what I'm talking about are timescales of a few years, maybe to many millennia, maybe. And this is a timescale that a lot of us will think about. Um, certainly, you know, at least in the conversations here, talking about the past ice ages as part of the common parlance and thinking about a few years, what might happen to this river, to this landscape, to this hill, to floods. That's something that people also think about. And it turns out that if we wonder why I'm focusing on these intermediate timescales. The reason is because we, if we look at these different approaches, two of them generally work on timescales that are either much shorter than or much longer than these intermediate timescales. So on the left-hand side, I have a, um, a large eddy simulation showing movement of eddies and, and so therefore affecting the velocity distributions and the mixing of velocity through the outdoor stream lab at the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory where I'm based. Over on the right hand side, we see a landscape evolution model um, by my postdoc Jeffrey Quang, who's very kindly teaching my class for me in about 40 minutes. So I'm able to be here with all of you. 
Um, thanks to Jeffrey. And so in the left hand side, you can see that we have like conservation, we have momentum, we have everything. And on the right hand side, it just gave it two winky faces because we have this nice, you know, stream power law, we have this nice hill slope diffusion, but those um, constant coefficients and exponents are kind of just case by case calibrated. And yeah, it totally makes sense if there's more drainage area, more slope, things might erode faster. Um, but we don't really have something that we can actually plug in like a viscosity or density that's measurable. Um, so we end up inverting these, this um, equation from landscapes if we're trying to understand those parameters very often. And yeah, on the left, these dynamics are occurring over the order of seconds. And on the right hand side, we have dynamics occurring over time scales of typically millions of years, maybe a little less, but often millions of years. So if I put this on this little time scale diagram, um, and it, after, after a little bit of work, I figured out how to get Python to turn off the Y axis without turning off the X axis. So if anyone runs into that particular issue, I'm happy to, to share a bit of earned wisdom. Um, what I'm showing are typical time scales of dynamics simulated and in years. And engineers will often simulate things that happen even if they care about longer terms in the short term. So what is actually the pressure balance behind a dam? What might happen with this flow to sediment entrainment, um, for example, which often will go into what might happen over a few days of flood recession. Geoscientists, on the other hand, um, especially the geologists, are often looking at these timescales of here I have 10,000 years and, and greater. And there are a number of people who are really interested in the, these intermediate timescales. And there is a huge amount of field data and, um, and conceptual understanding and some modeling approaches as well. But I would say that even if our geoscience scientists are looking down to these shorter timescales as well, and our engineers are looking up to these longer timescales as well, um, especially in areas like, let's say, river meander bend migration, that by and large, our, our models and applications seem to fall into these two areas. At least that's, um, that's my hypothesis for why people fund me to do this sort of thing, but maybe they actually just like me, but I think that that's much less likely. If we look at these two different kind of scales of, of processes, we also have very different images in our mind. On the left-hand side, I have a dam that was starting to fail in Scotland from a paper about geomorphology and engineering. And on the right-hand side, I have a, a figure from Tristan Sell's GitHub page on Badlands, which is a model that's you know, eroding the landscape, moving sediment, creating the sedimentary record. And so we see that both of these, both of these fields are able to interact with the real world, but often over these scales. In between, however, and let's say from like several days to kind of order, you know, 10,000 years, we have, or perhaps a bit longer, in fact, in, in the case of glaciation, um, we have climate oscillations, we have climate change impacts on our landscapes, which is something that we're deeply concerned about right now. And I can tell you certainly, you know, it's been in the conversation um, in Germany when I've been there, and very much so here in the north central US, where we are going from a snow dominated environment to a rain dominated environment, which you can imagine is changing the entire hydrology of the rivers, and therefore has effects on the geomorphology. There's also extreme event response that we can, that we think about um, over these kind of intermediate timescales. Um, even if the event is very short, oftentimes there are longer term effects on the landscape. Um, and the expansion of humans into many more environments, um, the onset of agriculture happened a little bit more than 10,000 years ago. Um, and in fact, agriculture has occurred over multiple, um, independently in multiple places of the world. And we also have variability throughout the Holocene and the end of the Pleistocene glaciation. Turns out that these um, events have two major, um, I'd say two major motivators to push me to work at these sorts of timescales. One of them is a need. So how will a river respond to, you know, ENSO cycles? How will a river respond to an extreme event? How do we impact river-related hazards? We also, um, and we also, I think, 
I mentioned this earlier, but we also quite clearly have questions about what's going to happen as climate changes, and we might enter areas that are not precedented in our historical records. However, such large climate changes, if not by pace, then certainly by magnitude, might be related in related to us through the geological record. And this shorter term kind of late Pleistocene to Holocene geological record is gives us information about the past with a lot less ambiguity than if we're going far, much farther back into the geological past, right? That's that's one of the reasons why our stream power law for you know fluvial modeling is so simple because we're dealing with so many unknowns that if we have a complicated equation, it becomes very hard to make useful. But maybe we can actually take a little bit more of that, the real physics and complexity in when we look over these, for example, deglacial to present time scales, and perhaps we can start to blend our knowledge of the past with what we need to know into the future. And so for just a few examples, the first one I wanted to pull up, um, many of you might be familiar with Louise Slater and her work. Um, I found this to be really inspiring to think about um, what actually causes these changes in river channels. Louise has become the master and has long been of wrangling large data sets and finding among them some really, really interesting, really and sometimes surprising trends. And one of them was, is this, is showing just how much across, in this case, using the data sets from here in the USA, um, showing just how much um, in this panel C, we can have changes in flood hazard due to either flood, um, you know, bed degradation, so erosion widening, creating more space for the flow, or bed aggradation and, and or channel narrowing, creating less space for the flow. And th these channel capacity effects can be um, often, you know, similar orders to changes in the precipitation or other drivers, medi meteorological drivers of flooding. These are things that really still aren't considered very strongly by flood planners, certainly here. Um, although I've heard more about this um, in the UK and in Europe. So I'm, I'm glad this word is starting to spread. Um, we also have need because we can have significant hazards from these hydrogeomorphic feedbacks. And this is just from a bit of work that my former master's student, Jimmy Wood did. Jimmy's now out actually as a working in Yosemite National Park on landslide and rockfall hazard. And before this, he, um, developed quite the skill for diving into historical records and historical archives to get some information about how that landscape has changed and actually quantify landscape change over sort of 100-year timescales. Um, over here, we can see in the orange line, I'll just move my mouse, hopefully you can see it. These are going in the same place. And so if you look at this, you know, some of the structures over here, look at the orange line moving along the trees, you can kind of match up where this orange line was, where this orange line bridges, where that is. So this entire piece of landscape was removed due to sedimentation in this river, widening and so on. And that all followed your American agriculture. Um, and in fact, our community is really answering some of these needs in big ways. So um, I got turned on to this, this work actually by reviewing this paper, but um, this recent paper by Ila Arbos et al. is showing what happens in the Rhine River, likely under different scenarios of sea level rise and or, you know, water supply. And what she's able to do is show bed elevations changing between, you know, now and the year 2100. And this can be important for everything from flood hazard to thinking about um, navigation and probably things that I don't even know about as, as well. Um, so all of all this is to say that we're, you know, we're building these sorts of models and there's more need to do it. Um, we also see opportunity in this. So this is an example from a paper from Karen Gran from um, 2013. My gosh, I can't believe that was 10 years ago. And she's applying this same basic stream power incisional model to a river that's incised into cohesive glacial till. So essentially a fast eroding pro you know, proxy for bedrock. These tills are very um, silt rich, quite cohesive. And this river is, is incising down to the Minnesota River, which itself incised in a couple episodes 
or you know between about 13.4 and 10.5 thousand years ago and so she, what she's able to do then is essentially start the stopwatch see how far the erosion has progressed and in fact calibrate some of these values that we use in our geomorphic models and see how well they work in a kind of controlled but natural experiment and we also have unnatural experiments. So this is going back to what Jimmy was doing. And over here in the lower left, we're, say, we're showing centimeters per year of, of sedimentation. And this is over a period from 1855 to 1939. And if you don't like multiplying things by, let's say, 84 years, we can just say multiply it by 100. And we get, you know, in these darker blue areas, two meters of aggradation. And we can start to look at these patterns connect them to past agricultural land use and see things that we might want our models to be able to reproduce, such as the fact that when we have these tributaries coming through the Nick zone of this river, joining and entering into this broader valley, we see significant sedimentation. So we should be able to simulate, you know, tr sediment transport through the steep part, deposition in the gentle part. And that all makes complete sense, right? It's something that we'd be able to intuit ourselves. But it's something that if we can make quantitative interpretations of, then we might be able to make quantitative predictions into the future that could help us with hazard or hopefully just help convince people to do things, you know, take actions that are safer and more sustainable in the first place. So with that, I just um, didn't know how to make a transition. So I, I looked at some photos, was looking at photos of rivers and found photos of my cat instead and decided that um, she, her name is Fjord, by the way, she was named by my first grad student because she, she thought I would find it incredibly nerdy. Um, so Fjord the cat is descending from her treehouse onto the tree. And we'll look at our wild, natural, and also human influenced world. And I'm gonna share three vignettes of how rivers are changing over these timescales. I'm gonna spend the most time on the first one and do something that I don't often do, um, which is actually in a talk, go through all of the equations on something. So usually I'll just go through the figures and talk about kind of the shiny results. But here, um, what I, I think that there's a lot of value in it because the way that, this is going back to a paper in 2019 that Taylor Shildren and I published. And we ended up finding a lot of things that we didn't expect when coupling equations. And a lot of ways, in fact, that rivers tend to filter what happens in their environments into signals that are much more linear and much more regular than we might otherwise expect. And so, so it's one of these times when nature is making our lives easier. So I thought, let's just, let's just look at it. Let's see how that works and maybe celebrate a little bit that when things are often hard, sometimes things can also be easy. After going through that and showing some examples, I'll talk about some more recent work we're doing on alluvial river channel width. And um, in particular, how that width of the channel evolves dynamically through time. And this is work that was, again, inspired by work that Louise and Abdu and others have been doing, trying to understand how the hydraulic geometry of rivers changes and what that means for flood capacity. Because there's going to be a two-way feedback. Because as the river widens, the same discharge will have a lower flow. That same discharge will not be able to mobilize as much sediment. Maybe the widening rate will slow down. And so we have this kind of push and pull of, of negative feedbacks that might in fact eventually dampen the flood response to climate change, but at the cost of some erosion and following some time of instability during transients. The last one I want, piece I wanted to talk about, and this is a figure from Jeffrey Quang again, who's, who's out teaching my class for me. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, and this is, you know, a figure just to inspire us to think about the dynamics of river networks. And in our case, what I'm going to be talking about is how sediment and, and signals from sediment move up and down a river network. Of course, similar approaches can be used and in fact have been used um, for bedrock. And I think that we have an approach that's, that's really clever. Um, I kind of like it. And I hope that you are going to enjoy thinking about how rivers are able to, as a fully connected system, send information about something that happens just in one tributary branch all the way up and all the way down the whole river network.
Okay, so we'll start over here on the left. This is a picture of Steffi Topelda in a gravel bed river in northwestern Argentina um, when we were there back in 2015. And as you can see, it's a gravel bed, gravel bank river. There's kind of not more kind of textbook ideal than you can than, than this. I feel like we could take um, Gary Parker in 1978 and and put him there, and and he could write his paper about this. Um, so. Why are am I working on alluvial rivers? I'll just talk about that first. Following that, I'll talk a little bit about my modeling approach and philosophy because every model also implies a particular set of values, and I want to share the share the ones that I have towards modeling with you. After that, I'll get really into the details of sediment discharge and the self formed hydraulic geometry of the channel, with the goal to predict alluvial river channel long profile change. So first off, why alluvial rivers? So they evolve over years to millions of years. Over time, of course, in a incising landscape, rivers will eventually touch down on bedrock. But in many parts of the world, rivers primarily are transporting and mobilizing alluvium. And alluvial rivers often are places that humans live around. They're a water source, they're a transportation source. Um, there are beneficial and harmful interactions that go both ways. Um, everything from you know pollution of rivers by humans to rivers you know kind of, kind of coming back and, and flooding towns um, to much more beneficial interactions of you know where we can appreciate being around the river and where the river also you know provides things that we want for our communities. The other piece is that they leave behind these beautiful records of their past. And so you can see across the valley here, and this is in the Rio Toro in Salta, Argentina, that we have this whole set of terraces here, 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 here. Um, and these are this is a whole set of fill and then cut terraces. Each of these tells us where the floodplain was at a given time. And if we can date these, as Sheffy did um, back during her PhD work, her, her doctoral work rather, um, you know how high the river was, where and when. And that sort of information is critical to being able to test models against these past geological records and hopefully improve the models. So what is what is my approach? Um, my approach, I think, is I, I find it to be super pragmatic. Um, maybe, maybe others will find it too simple or boring, but it works for me. So what I really want to do is maximize the number and diversity of links I can make to data. If I have a model that has a parameter that I can't directly compare against data, I start to become really worried and think, what, what in the world am I doing? Am I right? Am I not? Uh, I don't know. So instead, I minimize free parameters and try to bring everything back to things that can be measured in the field. Um, or with remotely sensed data or so on. The other piece I want, I try to do is make the models be efficient. And I do that so that we can enable ensembles to be run at the models. And so we don't have the um, to worry about, you know, reluctance to rerun models if we think our model experiment wasn't very good just because it's so expensive. And what that does is it fundamentally enables reproducibility of the science and, um, and as my colleague Richard Barnes once pointed out, well, if it isn't reproducible, you know, talking about model simulations that take, you know, several million CPUs, if it's not reproducible, is it even still science? And the last, my last piece here is to follow nature. So when thinking about how to set up grids, how to set up equations, um, I find it to be incredibly useful to go to the field and come back from the field to think about how nature works and to try to build the numerical grids in ways that track with the way that the landscape um, is passing information, passing sediment, water, so on. And instead of just saying, well, I think I'll do a rectangular grid, which there's nothing, nothing wrong with, but my, my preference is in fact to, to think about how can I make my grid better contoured to the landscape and the physical processes that we're seeing. So, here we are. So for the next several slides, I'm just going to go through how we derived an equation to solve for gravel bed river long profile evolution. Um, at the end of it, I'll make a little note about sand and at the very end about bedrock rivers. So we're trying to expand this um, significantly more widely. Um, but we're going to start here with the Exner equation, and that's just the equation of sediment mass balance. Um, on the left, 
I have one over this capital B, which is my value width. And then I have one minus porosity. And I multiply that by the, um, the change in sediment discharge with change in distance. There's a negative sign. So essentially, if more sediment goes in, then comes out, the bed rises. If more goes out, then goes comes in, the bed falls. And if the valley is wider, I'm looking currently at these time scales where I'm just considering what is the valley filling or is the valley eroding? We can think about shorter time scales too, uh, or, or shorter time scales of simply channel filling or erosion. That's another thing we can do. But for considering the entire valley as like a geomorphic unit, if the valley is wide, then it's going to take a lot more sediment to fill it up. If the valley is narrow, <clears throat> it'll take significantly less. The next equation down here is simply the meyer pedder and Mueller sediment transport formula, except I've expanded it into um, dimensional form in sediment discharge and multiply it by channel width to give us sediment discharge. So in terms of like length cube per time. Um, and over here, little b is width. Phi is a coefficient that it comes from the experiments. It's 3.97 in this case for sediment transport rate. Rho S, sediment density, rho water density, G, acceleration due to gravity. Um, tau star B and tau star C are the um, bed and critical shield stresses, so these dimensionless shear stresses, respectively. And so this is our three halves power that's characteristic of the meyer penner mueller formula. And then we end up having a grain size of the three halves that's also pulled out here um, that comes from turning this dim our formerly dimensionless um, sediment discharge per unit width into a dimensional sediment discharge per unit width, which we then multiplied by width to get full sediment discharge. So with that, a lot of these pieces that I mentioned were constants. Um, so, so let's think about where we can start, you know, moving into understanding this problem. Well, they're either constants or things that can be measured um, in the field, um, for example, grain size. So first off, I want to think about what sets channel width. And I want to note that hunting for channel width will eventually, will set up a hunt that will eventually simplify our search for excess shear stress, and in fact, nearly linearize this equation. And so it's one of these times where it feels very poetic. It's almost like nature is reaching out and saying, hey, come on, I think we can, I think I can help you understand this. So first off, I'm going to start out by making an assumption to help us get towards channel width that we only care about bank full flow. This is something that actually I'm I'm on in route to relaxing. And that's part of this um, work I'm doing with understanding river width dynamics is relaxing it um, channel forming, um, basically relaxing having a fixed or even in this case flexible hydraulic geometry that's adjusted to carry that amount of uh, water. But instead of having, you know, instead of having just something that's perfectly adjusted, having something that, that dynamically adjusts. And that's one of the things that where I get a lot of inspiration from Kensuke Naito and Gary Parker um, in their 2019 paper, where they were able to show how a meandering river um, can self-form its hydraulic geometry. And Astrid Bloom, whom I also re referenced over there, was able to show that just looking at a bank full flow or some characteristic discharge is in fact an appropriate way to understand river evolution and helps to, to kind of link the full hydrograph to this sort of more simplified scaling. Um, all right, so then on the left-hand side, I have just the equation of continuity. We have discharge there, Q, and I have that equaling mean velocity times width times depth. I'm also making a re rectangular channel approximation. Um, all of these, unfortunately, right now are unknown. So let's find a place to get started. And where I'm starting is, in fact, as I mentioned, Gary Parker's 1978 paper on purpose is the width closure that he came up with, showing that, um, that the shear stress at Bankful in you know, gravel bed rivers should and has now been proven to be right around the threshold for initiation of motion. And this is, in fact, not a gravel bed river specific argument is that it's quite a general one um, about the flow inside a channel that has walls. So flow over here on the right hand side is able to 
you know, experienced drag against walls on both sides, below and to the side of it. And flow in the middle only has channel underneath it that will that will help slow it down. And so if all if the river is not accelerating, then the shear stress ac across the bed needs to balance the shear stress from the dry the driving stress from the water. And therefore, in these wall regions, we have water flowing that with more distance, and so the force per unit area is going to be less. And that's one of the primary reasons that we can think about um, think about these these rivers being able to have a lower stress on longer banks, and then a higher stress in the channel center, which is still capable of moving sediment. So if we can do this, one of the, the magical thing that this does is it then um, allows us to relate the bed shear stress to the critical shear stress because the channel will always adjust. Let me back up. If this, there's the same material that's com that's composing the banks as is composing the bed, then we we can take that to be uniform and know that the channel will adjust, it will widen or narrow, such that it's just at that threshold of motion on the banks. And if we do that, then we have our bed shear stress become, in fact, just a, a very simple linear function of a constant, the critical shield, shield stress. What that means is if we go back to this first sediment transport equation, <clears throat> we take this tau star B minus tau star C to the three halves out and turn it into this term epsilon, which is about 0.2 tau star C to the three halves power. And it's a bunch of constants raised to a constant, so that's just another constant. And what we've done now is just removed this really nasty term that has a threshold and a nonlinearity in it and turned it into a constant. Interestingly, if we fix the walls of the channel, if we have, and, and so um, my colleague Astrid Bloom at TU Delft often has her models with fixed walls. And I think it's because I'm living in the USA where our rivers kind of do what they want. I guess freedom, right? And then um, over there, the rivers are um, where they should be. And so it depends on you know which, which system you want to study. Um, but one of the interesting things is that if we do have a fixed wall channel and there is more flow, instead of the channel being able to widen and linearize its response, it deepens. And so therefore it does in fact take advantage of this shear stress. So what this means is that if you look at kind of the free flowing rivers in Warsaw, they're going to be much more climate resilient than places like the Rhine because they might they might have to move some of the river baked restaurants and, and so on sadly, but but the river itself will not be undermining the city, hopefully. So if we go to um, over back to this equation, then we can see that we have a whole set of constants. Um, and on the left, we have channel width still, so we still haven't addressed that. And on the right, we have grain size. Um, and just wanted to emphasize the fact that, that here we're showing that, in fact, the morphodynamics of the system linearize the the long profile linearize the sediment discharge, therefore having linearizing effect on the eventual long profile evolution. And this is now bringing us back to Lane's balance, where we just have the simple linear relationship between discharge and um, you know, and morphologic response. And in fact, it's going to bear out quite close to that. So one thing that is maybe a little un counterintuitive here, or at least unintuitive, is that for a constant shield stress, sediment discharge actually increases with grain size, right? So I don't know if anyone, you know, is like, what, what's going on there? Or maybe you already get it. Um, the, it's, it's a really simple argument. It's just that big grains are bigger. Um, if we have a constant shield stress, it's not like the big grains are receiving a lower stress proportional to their threshold for motion they're receiving the exact same stress above the threshold for motion that a smaller grain would. But if we have a channel with just a, if with an active layer that's order a grain depth or a couple, then if we have big grains, they're simply larger. And so they're simply moving more volume. And that three halves power addresses, you know, the spherical kind of the integral across the spherical slices to think about how much material moving a spherical grain will, well, move. All right, this width closure has a second implication. Um, um, on the upper left, I've drawn out the equation for um, dimensionless um, bed shear stress. So this is the shield stress. And I've used the 
steady uniform flow. So the normal flow approximation to use a depth slope product in the numerator in place of just having a generic um, bed shear stress. And guess what? We can also combine this with this river width closure. And I've just, you know, spared you some algebra. But what we see is that the depth and the slope trade off with drain size. And all the terms to the left here are constants. So for a given slope, depth increases linearly as grain size increases. And that makes sense because if, if the grain size increases, um, the shield stress has a linear relationship with grain size. And so the if grain size doubles, then we need twice as much flow depth to be able to mobilize that grain. All right, so let's return to continuity. Got a little, little smiley face there for um, depth because we got that, but we still have two unknown terms. And if we bring this down to just one unknown term, which ideally is going to be our width, then we'll be able to bring this into the other equation and complete our solution. However, um, well, I shouldn't say however, I'd say in fact, um, this is really convenient because flow velocity is also, as, as many of you know, a function of depth. So let's write an equation for that. And I'm going to use Manning's equation why? Because it works pretty well, and it's a power law, and if I'm going to have to solve differential equations, I'd much rather solve power laws than logarithms. And in fact, there are some papers showing a theoretical basis for um, the scales of turbulence involved from their effects on velocity um, through, um, through Manning-style equation. So here, I have already transformed this using relation a relationship between grain size and... Um, and roughness. So we have over here 5.9 square root of gravity, depth to the two thirds, slope to the one half. That should look super familiar from Manning's equation over grain size, the d to the one sixth power, which is giving us our flow resistance or roughness term. Well, there's a depth there. So let's pull in our recently acquired equation for depth, which we have. We can plug that in here to the two thirds power. Um, and in fact, we've multiplied by depth again, so that just takes depth to the five thirds power and insert mean velocity where that is. And here we are. We now have all the terms solved for with just the leverage of having this, um, this river channel with closures. If you've seen several folks working on river channel with problems, you know, recently, um, this is why, because river channel width is really what sets the partitioning of stress and in fact helps us to understand do we have a narrow channel with high stresses that can move a lot of material do we have a wide channel that can't move so much material and for understanding morphological evolution flood conveyance capacity and um and sediment transport capacity understanding the width feedback is critical so here we are we're starting to have these extremely long equations but almost everything in here is constant so these are, so on the upper left, this is what we are already looking at, our sediment transport formula. I'm plugging in river width um, as it relates to the other variables from the terms in this equation below. And one interesting thing you can see is that we have river width divided by grain size to the three halves power. What that means is that as grain sizes get bigger, the river width narrows. And that's natural. That comes from this, this width closure to be able to have enough stress against the banks that sediment can still be mobilized. Well, it just turns out that because of a combination of our geometric relationship with sediment um, flow rate, the constant shield stress argument and, that, and also that extra one sixth power that comes in from the Manning style equation that grain size cancels. And that is wild. So what that means is that gravel bed rivers will actually adjust their hydraulic geometry such that grain size also balances in parts of the equation. And so these gravel bed rivers should be able to, to evolve in a similar way, although of course with a different plan form, certainly with a different width, um, but in longitudinal profile, it should be able to evolve similarly, regardless of their grain size. And that is a striking um, simplification and something I found to be very interesting. Well, if we take this, a little farther, once we plug in the, the B, this width term here, 
all of this stuff is constant times a width. And then we have a bunch of constants on the left here too, and just discharge slope to the seven six power. We lump all those constants together into this big KQS term, and we have a value times discharge times slope to the seven six. This is a stream power style relationship. And this takes me back to being a grad student when I was working with Bob Anderson. And Bob would say things like, oh yeah, like sediment transport, we'll just put, we'll just use stream power for that, you know? And I, and I was like, but Bob, like, we have like formulas that people have tested in labs. He's like, well, yeah, but like stream power. I was like, ah, and I, and I was, I was so incredibly like, why are you doing this? You know, not even, I just confused. And now I have to say that like, well, it turns out I shouldn't have been. Bob was right. I guess we can just use stream power and that gives us sediment discharge. And that's because of these internal adjustments in these alluvial rivers, specifically the gravel bed rivers. Um, although we'll see shortly that it might in fact extend to sand as well. Um, and indeed seems to. And the other thing, getting back to the modeling philosophy I was sharing earlier, is that down here, we have you know, the width closure term term, this term that relates to the sediment transport rate, densities, um, for example, shield stress, all of these are known. So instead of having some tunable K, like we do in the stream power law, where it's just like, yeah, well, I guess we'll make that work. No, we actually know what K should be. And what that means is that we might be not always be right. But then if we know what these parameters are, and we're trying to do a study in the field, we can know how we're wrong and we can know why we're wrong and we can know how to do the model, you know, do create these models in a better way. And I think being able to check, being able to know whether you're right or wrong is really like the key um, criterion for being able to make progress. And so here we are, we have a sudden discharge equation with literally zero tunable parameters. So what do we do? We we have to, we are going to add in one tunable parameter to the to this equation, but um, that's something we can also inform from field data. So we're going back to the Exner equation on the upper left for conservation of mass, and then on the lower left um, we have our equation for um, for long the river long profile evolution, which comes from inserting our sediment discharge term up here into the Exner equation. And I'm looking at the time. And so for so all of you know, this is a new talk and I was thinking 50 minutes, but I'm really glad I was because we're, we might be going more towards the standard landscapes live hour, um, but I'll make sure I, I make some time in these up in these next slides. The other couple sections are gonna be shorter. Um, so, and if you're sitting in your PJs, just go have some breakfast or lunch or dinner, whatever time it is. Um, here we are, um, it, once we plug this whole equation together, what we get is a bunch of constants and I've added in this intermittency factor. So how often do we have this bank full flow? That's our tunable parameter. I've also added in a sinuosity that just, you know, I didn't include in the in the derivation to keep things simpler. And on the right hand side, a source sink term that could be hill slope set in the supply entering. It could be class attrition from downstream finding leaving. Um, it can be tectonics, uplift subsidence. And in the end, I have a bunch of derivatives and things, but here we are, we have discharge, times slope to the seven six power, which makes this all be a slightly nonlinearly diffusive equation, which is in fact not too different from what Chris Paola and others came up with in 1992, despite the fact that I put some work into a much more exacting derivation. But hey, I'm pretty happy about what the coefficients are. And so we'll keep it at that. It turns out that sand bed rivers for totally different reasons are similarly well behaved or at least most of the different reasons. <clears throat> so unlike these gravel bed rivers, they lack a significant threshold to motion and natural flows. You can think of the England Hansen formula if you're familiar with it, but they also have bank cohesion controlling their width closure according to work both here and done is done. <clears throat> and I'll leave um, Nilay to share a bit more about this with you if any of you are going to be at AGU or you can contact her. <clears throat> but she and I have been working through this and she's, um, writing the code in the paper right now, but it turns out that sand bed rivers are similar. They have a five, six power on slope instead of a seven, six. But again, it seems that in fact, <clears throat> what I wanna tell you, I think I think that some people like saying, well, look, we've come up with this brand new thing. We have to throw everything away and we have to move on. And for me, that's like horrific because it's, there's all that work that was put in. I don't wanna start over and I'll do it if I have to, but here we are. 
you guys who've been using uh, linear diffusive models for sediment transport and basin filling, filling or have used um, stream power based um, approaches to estimate sediment discharge. Well, it turns out it actually matches our mathematics when going back to basic fluid flow and experiments. So I guess uh, it could work. Um, <clears throat> and the gravel bed solution, this is just to show it works. We actually have a, an analytical solution. I'm really glad about that. We can compare it to the numerical solution. They overlap. Phew, good, right? And we can look at how the channel is evolving. So for example, on the left, we have response to instantaneous base level fall. And I really want you to pay attention to the fact that unlike the stream power models, which many might be more familiar with looking, with looking at, we don't have a SNCC point that's add backing upstream, but rather we have this diffusive profile kind of smoothing upstream. And so in fact, in different places, we're going to have, instead of kind of like nothing, 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 everything, we're going to have more likely just a different set of incision rates that through time. If we change uplift or substance, we, move, we adjust along profile. So with uplift, the profile goes from being gentler to being steeper um, because it needs it has a constant new supply of sediment it needs to export. Opposite with substance, or if you think about like base level rise, the river needs to deposit sediment to keep up with how much accommodation space is being created. So there we are. It's, it's increasing its curvature and it's decreasing its slope as a result, in order to um, in order to deposit enough sediment to fill in. We also have <clears throat> um, if it, he, over here on the left, if the input of sediment double, doubles and with the water discharge being constant, we have the river increasing in slope, kind of according to Lane's balance, kind of exactly according to Lane's balance. And in the left-hand side here, if we double water discharge, we decrease the slope according to Lane's balance. And you notice that you see a lot fewer lines here, noting these intermediate time steps. And the reason for that is because we've doubled the water discharge and therefore the rate at which the sediment can be transported has increased linearly with that. And so the river is going to then <clears throat> incise faster as well. And this means that we should expect a hysteresis. In fact, if we have you know, cycles of increasing sediment supply versus cycles of increasing water supply. All right, so I'm gonna aim to wrap up in about 10 minutes and I've got a whole load of slides and some of them are kind of fun. So we're gonna, we're gonna move to them as, as fast as I can and we might skip through a few. For alluvial river width, I wanted to share with you first a photo and then um, the fact that we're just gonna spoil the secret sauce from our last derivation because what if, what if we have rivers that are changing even faster than I have in this derivation, which is kind of looking at maybe decadal and maybe centennial timescales of long profile evolution, these timescales in which changes in river slope can start to be significant. Um, but what if we're interested in shorter intermediate timescales, short enough that the rivers are not yet re-equilibrating re their widths? Here, and then this brings up the question I had before, if there's a geomorphic lag in response to this hydrological forcing, could this cause a transient anomaly and flood hazard? For example, again, if there are larger rainfall events and the river hasn't yet had enough time to widen, we're going to see more overbank flooding, perhaps more overbank deposition, definitely more sediment transport, definitely more erosion. And over time, though, that might be able to equilibrate with new channel geometries. And so therefore, the rate of the forcing and the rate of response are important. And getting back to Luis's argument about channel conveyance capacity, it might be really important to think about the pace of climate forcing from anthropogenic effects compared to the pace at which the natural system, in this case, the fluvial system can buffer that. And I'm just gonna dash through here. Um, essentially, if we have high stresses in the channels, they can mobilize material on the banks and widen. If we have intermediate stresses, maybe the bank stress is still below the threshold for motion, but we have enough stress to mobilize sediment in the channel center that can diffuse over to the channel margins and become stuck there. And if there is low water, well, probably nothing's moving other than you know what birds or burrowing animals might be doing to those banks. And what are the mechanisms? Essentially, we have, um, I just have a detachment related erosional mechanism here for channel widening and for channel narrowing, I have diffusive related um, motion of suspended and bed load sediment. 
um, moving through, you know, approximate random walk. There could be other diffusive processes happening as well. So many processes are diffusive, it's hard to tell which is which, but these are the two that we're simulating. And if we look at this channel response, I'm taking discharge and then increasing it significantly and then dropping it significantly. And so first we see channel width equilibrate to the new discharge, equilibrate to the next discharge, and then decrease down to a final value. And down here, we also have the rates of change. And at the bottom, the ratio of bank stress to the critical stress to move sediment. And we keep it right around 1.0, a little bit off because of our flux balance approach. There might always be a little bit of erosion and a little bit of deposition. But this means that we recover the equilibrium um, solution as well. Just as an example, this is the Minnesota River. Um, farmers have been installing tile drains, um, especially as climate change has led to be, there, there to be more rainfall so they can plant their otherwise waterlogged fields. Of course, this then takes that additional rainfall and sends it directly to the rivers, which does things like you see in the photo on the right um, and uh, undermine people's homes and or other infrastructure and or large bluffs of sediment. And if we take this full hydrograph of the Minnesota River, we can then fit, and by the way, this was this is preliminary. Um, it's been preliminary for a while because I've been working on a couple other projects. If you're interested in this, don't worry. It's like front burner now. Um, this is um, the model fit just by eye versus these data points of how wide the channel is. And it doesn't seem to fit too badly. So it seems that we might be able to, in fact, take a full hydrograph and simulate efficiently the fluvial response. And if you're interested in applying this model, um, it's up online on PyPy. And I'm going to skip past, but anyone looking at YouTube can pause right here and grab the QR code. All right. So the third and final piece are river network dynamics. And here, I was thinking I might run over, so I just have a couple of videos, but we're going to run to return to these one dimensional long profiles and expand them into a network and have each segment inside our network, each one of these tributary junctions, um, interact with each other with the upstream rivers supplying water and sediment to the downstream river and the downstream river setting the base level for the upstream river. And that way we create these dynamically evolving sort of internal boundary conditions within the, um, within the solution. I could go into how to set up the solution matrix. I think it's quite quite nice, but you can solve the entire watershed network in one, ma one matrix um, in a semi-implicit solution. Um, Jeffrey Quang, by the way, was responsible for this really beautiful figure here. So again, a couple of slides I'm going to go through quickly. Jeffrey created this thing called Topo Blender to create really just beautiful visualizations of DEMs and also of model landscapes. So there's a GitHub for that, that you can pause the YouTube to find. And here, and likewise, he's created on his own, um, you know, personal webpage, some of the things that he's using to teach my class right now, including, um, you know, a rainfall simulator, a hill slope diffusion simulator, so you can play with natural landscapes um, in, in classes, if anyone is interested in these. Um, yeah, reach out to Jeffrey, um, reach out to me, I can put you in touch with him. All right. So first off, let's see what happens in this alluvial river with base level fall, but then we can actually have a movie. There we go. So we have base level fall at the downstream end, and it's propagating upstream diffusively very quickly already. But by the time it reaches some of these upper branches of the tributary network, the incision starts to occur much more slowly. And that's because we have, we, I still prescribe the same valley width everywhere, but these upper reaches have a significantly um, significantly less water discharge. So the rate changes. And so this, this network structure can then modulate the pace at which you know, these signals of climate, for example, or base level propagate up and down an alluvial river network. <clears throat> All right, that's gonna keep running, but I'm gonna pass this on to the next one, which is on base level rise, which is just the opposite. And so as base level rises, we see the river have you know, kind of an equal and opposite response. And we have these, some of these rivers like this red one where there's just one valley of sediment to fill up versus these two where there are two valleys of sediment to fill up with compared with less water, I think that I assigned than the red one. Well, they're all again adjusting at their given pace. 
And when there, it's equilibrated, the entire river network should be a mirror image of the initial one, just raised higher. Finally, and this third example I think is the most interesting, is involving landslides. So we're going to see a couple landslides on this landscape, and they're going to dam sediment upstream and steepen topography downstream from them. And we're going to see those, those changes propagate through the river network as the sediment, and I'm just going to play it as the sediment um, approaches tributary junctions, dams the other tributaries we can see is happening with the Blue River. So we actually have set alleviation in this in this river that wasn't even downstream of the landslide. We have another landslide that just occurred in this red segment. And the entire system right now is perturbed and is higher than it used to be. So I'm going to just do one, give you one more shot at that. And so you can see how these different landslide signatures are then propagating through the fluvial network. So hopefully this has inspired some ideas, some thoughts, maybe some interest in alluvial rivers and how they how they respond. Hopefully you have ideas that I haven't had because that's always more interesting. And I also want to show that um, a few folk in my research group, as well with some help from um, just the wonderful work on Land Lab that the CSDMS team has done, have created um, a preliminary way to use Land Lab coupled with the, this approach to extract real river network, um, real river networks and let them evolve. All right, I'm gonna skip over this last section that I made, which was me worrying that I didn't have enough slides, which always happens, and I move to the end. But just to say that um, we have, you know, these unnatural experiments, including, as I mentioned, this environmental disaster in the Whitewater Valley that Jimmy was studying, and I mentioned at the beginning, where you have sedimentation. And in fact, he can look at different time steps and see as we're moving through, we have more of this red and more erosion in the uplands, transportation of that sediment discharge pulse downstream. And Jimmy is going to be um, very rapidly publishing this, I hope. Um, he's currently mostly out of contact while working at Yosemite, but I think working on it. And our goal is to get this data set out in everyone's hands. We're not gonna try to interpret it ourselves. We, want, we think that this is just an extraordinarily valuable data set for anyone who's studying fluvial geomorphology to have. So our first goal is giving it to everyone, and then we're going to work on figuring it out ourselves and maybe with support of some friends, um, maybe some of you, find out what's happening here. We also have some in-process work on understanding the, um, the qu late quaternary history, which can go in parallel to that, and that's to understand that if we're just looking at these short time scales, we might not actually see, we might see something that looks linear because we're missing the whole dynamics of the system that could be important to understand something like climate change. And we're now in fact expanding this to a set of catchments with different lithologies along the Lake Superior Basin, where we can start to test um, equations like the ones that Alan Wall and Mike Lamb and others have developed for bedrock rivers and um, for in this case quarrying or what Leonard Sklar and others have done on abrasion. Um, and so these sorts of mechanistic bedrock approaches might also be integrated soon into our, our modeling approach. All right, with all that, um, I'm basically just at an hour. So, um, so thanks very much for your attention. Um, essentially, if I can boil this down to a few main points, rivers actually kind of make their study easier by canceling out terms in the equations or linearizing them because of their internal dynamics, which is just like marvelous. Um, the second piece, is that we can simulate these transient width dynamics. The paper's not out yet, but the code's there and it's stable. Um, I just need to get done teaching and get on writing. Um, and then the third piece is that these rivers have conversations with each other among tributary components through networks. And I'm hoping that by combining these approaches, we can better predict landscape disequilibrium and dynamics into the near and also kind of uncertain future and guide that with our knowledge of physics and the past. Are there any questions? And um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Andrew. It was a really nice talk. So we have the chat now open for questions. I don't think that we have much time, but at least a couple of questions can be replied. Does anyone has a question or can I may make one? <laughs> you know, okay. Um, well, I'm just grabbing from your last uh, sentence. Uh, what you wrote. 
Um, and the way that I see it um, is that most of the questions that you are presenting and the models that you are presenting, they can be very useful for predicting the climate resilience of your fluvial um, ecosystems. Um, considering the first part of your presentation where you were describing the alluvial rivers, I was wondering how could you, in your modeling philosophy, as you were noting before, how can you introduce fast changes in geometry and grain size um, in terms of the intermediate timescales of prediction in the future? Thanks, Ria. That's, that's a great question. It's, I think you hit the fact that that's something that we're not doing in that model. And it's because these intermediate timescales cover such a wide range, right? Everything from a few days, where you might see these big perturbations that you mentioned, to sort of more of the like decades to centuries, where perhaps they're, they're smoothed out in some way. And where that model was fitting was kind of more in those longer timescales. And it's precisely for the reason that you mentioned that I felt dissatisfied by some of what we had done. And I think it's quite useful. It solves very quickly. It can give us some, it, it give, give us quite good answers against geological data. Um, and it's also really important, I think, to know where to not just say, oh, we've got a model, great. But to know like inside this model, we're assuming that these things are constant, that these things are more important, these things are less important. And so on these shorter timescales, I think that, yeah, the change in grain size, the change in bank composition, the change in river widening, narrowing, or deep, you know, <laughs> Beg your pardon. Um, well, I'll be will all be really important, and so I'm hoping that we can start to address that with this river width dynamics portion. Um, and we are just starting to look at grain size dynamics. Um, Nilai, the student I mentioned, is working also on coupling these models in with the gravel sand transition and different um, size sediment sources from hill slopes and tributaries. Um, and I think that our our current plan is to use this network approach to not just break the network at tributary junctions, but to break it in other places too, where we see major changes in the driving forces or the dynamics. For example, where there's a large um, you know, change in the sediment grain size, or where there could even be a landslide that temporarily dams the river where it can change it into a section that's actually a depression that's just collecting material. So these are all things that are, are, are definitely on our mind and, and we started in a simpler place. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a question in, in the chat from Caroline. Uh, she said, thank you for the great talk. My question is, could you check this equation? Uh, could you please, Andrew, check the chat? So I don't need to. <laughs> yep, yep, I'm, yep I'm, I'm reading it. Yeah, so Caroline ah, great. Is, is saying, could you check this equation on field data? Um, so that's that's exactly what we're trying to do right now. So in this watershed that I have pictured, we have um, what I was mentioning about with Jimmy's data on this past change. And we also have what my student Shanti is doing on the longer term evolution of the river system. And so we can see how it works against two different timescales. We're just getting back all of our luminescence and cosmogenic um, data. And, and so I'm, I'm pretty curious about this too. Um, Jimmy's getting his data together into the database now. We're putting together this ability to run this model in a network. So we don't know yet. Um, we should know soon. And my, if I had to create an idea, I think that if we're, again, getting back to Rita's question, if we're looking at long enough timescales that we can filter out some of the variability of the rapid river channel adjustments and or you know changes in, in the boundary conditions really affecting the river um, in very specific localized ways, then we're, I think the, the model is going to do well. I think it might it might do more poorly I'm I'm curious if it does more poorly in response to for the sedimentation in response to Euro-American agriculture because that did change the hydraulic geometry quickly, and so we're also going to see did the hydraulic geometry actually keep pace with the forcings or not, um, and so so that that's the first thing yeah you create something and then you try to break it. Okay, do we have any other question? Anything? I have another one. Ah, uh, Pedro, go ahead, please. No, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just gonna <clears throat> ask uh, Andrew a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Um, this is great to to see some of the nitty gritty behind that paper that you published um, with Taylor Schultz. And I, 
I'm curious about the the uh, photo you showed with the undermining um, and um, where you have this sort of vertical wall next to, to one of these rivers. And so the question that I had was, is, is that something you can actually capture uh, from, from these models that you're uh, running at this point? And um, if, if you can say anything about you know the material of the river bank how that influences the probability of those undermining episodes happening or the or where you can actually trigger them hmm. so are you thinking about these figures or was the photo that you were considering? You, you, the photo is you just pass the photo yeah okay oh this one right here yeah 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 exactly yeah, okay. So yeah, that, that's something that we thought about <clears throat> in how we set up this model. Um, Gary Parker and his group, so that includes Kinsuke Naito and Esther Eche, have worked on this idea that as that there's undermining and then slump blocks armor the bank. Um, and I thought, well, I, I looked at that and that was often a lot of the most complicated part of like the mathematics and explanations of their paper. And then it was also tied to a single mechanism. And I believe that that was important for what they were doing. And I also like to try to reduce, again, with the philosophy, try to reduce parameters and simplify things. And so what I thought was that, well, if we have, for example, here, a large glacial till bank and it falls into the river, well, there's still just as much glacial till to erode. It's just down low instead of up high. And so therefore there should just be, in, in, my, in my approach, what I'm just doing is saying that one way or another, the river needs to a road through the entire height of the bank in order to move laterally one unit. Um, and then the bank erosion is just a simple like uh, detachment limited rule of like excess shear stress above some value. So it's it's super duper simple. Um, it's the same thing that I've read in a lot of like um, engineering handbooks. And so hopefully it, it works well enough. Um, but yeah, so, so it basically throws away some of those detailed processes of undercutting for um, for sort of more of a bulk parameter. Thank you. Okay, well, if you allow me, I can do the last question. Um, I got really, um, the first one of the things that you said at the beginning of the talk that it was bringing on my, my, my head was the difference when you were recalling your friends from Netherlands, the difference from uh, rivers, natural systems and rivers that were blocked with the seawalls. Know? and mm -hmm. I would and how that affect with the width of closure that you were trying to investigate at the beginning. I was wondering if you managed so far in your research to to see how much the human presence in this kind of fluvial networks interferes with the rates of evolution that they can have in terms of width of closure, depth of closure, or even the, the sand bank accumulation, um, uh, how much it increased the rate of accumulation, or on the other hand, decreased the rate of accumulation. I don't know if you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. So first off, I just want to make say, say that I think <clears throat> I think Astrid's group is just doing like wonderful work, and what she and she's taking on that nonlinear problem, but also because she has these fixed banks, it makes it a bit easier for her to do other things like include. Uh, the the backwater equations to be able to have non non steady flow. So she includes some more complicated physics that she's able to use to just make these future predictions. Um, and um, for for me, I think well, we're actually right next to this slide here, and so this might be the best um, quick answer I could give to your question. So what we see is in this river that was pictured in the previous slide, we've gone from about sixty five meters of width in nineteen the late nineteen thirties to about a decade ago, um, a little over 110 meters of width. And that is secondarily due to the fact that we're having more big precipitation events and more rain than snow. And it's primarily due to direct human impact on the landscape. So this is all in a deglacial area, a deglacial depositional area that would have been full of lakes and wetlands. And those were drained agriculturally um, early on. And then following that, um, 
farmers inserted this uh, subsurface drainage to be able to drop the water tables in their fields to keep the, the, the plants healthy and the roots from rotting. And what this did is it turned is the entire watershed into the equivalent of a like of a parking plaza and the water would just fall on these fields go straight to these pipes underground and go straight into the river and where there used to be really gentle hydrographs the hydrographs became very steep and so um we have basically changed the characteristics of the of the geomorphically effective floods and so down here on the bottom, you can see on the left-hand side, we have a few big floods and some really the giant rainstorm, rainfall events. But when we're getting kind of past about 1990, when plastic pipes started to be installed in the ground, we started having very regular floods of the kinds that would only occur once every several decades. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, one of the biggest changes that we're seeing to hydraulic geometry. And this hydraulic geometry change is ongoing. Um, I and this is part of my motivation, right? This is where I'm from. I want to know, are we anywhere close to the stopping or are we continuing to force the system so hard that it's going to continue to widen and erode and be unrecognizable? Thank you. Do we have any questions? No? Okay, so maybe we can stay here. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for accepting our invitation and for such a nice uh, talk that we had today. Uh, thank you for everyone that was attending. Next week, we have another seminar, another talk. So don't miss it. And that's it. See you next week, guys. <laughs>